The topic of this panel is on a major power relationship between U.S. and China. So uh, we're going to have two very interesting speakers here. You know, immediately on my left. You know, most of you, if you've you know, watched politics and so forth, you know this gentleman. You know, he's been in politics for many, many years. Before you were born. <laughs> You know, basically, he just graduated from college and immediately went into politics. That you were in politics since 1980, right? 1980, he joined as a congressman, you know, and been there for 30 some odd years, and recently retired and now chair the uh, Annenberg Dryer Commission in Sunnyland. So I'm going to talk to uh, Congressman Dryer later on about uh, what happened in Sunnyland. A year ago. So, uh, and my further left is uh, Bill Mundell, entrepreneur. He also uh, occasionally in the movie business. So, I thought that <laughs> this afternoon, uh, I'm not going to give any introduction and background information and so forth because we were running a little bit late. But uh, right after three speeches, what you need is to watch a movie. So why don't we just go ahead and watch a show? In this country, who would like to make China an enemy? I've always said about that, well, well, hell, the best way to find an enemy is to go looking for one. People actually believe China is out there constantly ready to threaten the United States. That's a danger because it obscures our ability to focus on the larger issues that we really should be addressing. China's not only going to be an economic power, it's going to be a power in all aspects to being a power. And we're saying, no, if we feel that's ours, we have a right to say it's ours. We have public opinion to consider. We have our allies to consider. You have to come to an understanding with your adversary. On the other hand, we can't be naive. Not all our national interests are the same. What books do you pick up? What do you see on the internet? What do you see that is portrayed positively about China? Very little. A lot of people are saying that American workers are losing their jobs to China. It's the manufacturers that are shipping the jobs overseas. It's the Americans that are the biggest part of the problem. I think that Americans are very open-minded when it comes to other cultures, as long as they behave American. That won't work out in China. You have to understand that people will not become like you. The communist thing is done. That means we want to call war. We convince him to drink our cocktail. I think that the rise of to more peace and prosperity for all of us. We know the costs of failure are so profound that we have to figure out a way to talk to each other. And we are.
Well, it looks like something you're ready for Oscar. Huh? <laughs> well, tell me a little bit more about this, uh, this movie. And uh, so what caused you to decide to make this movie? Well, thank you, uh, Dominic. Um, let, me, let me first uh, say on behalf of myself and uh, my co-producer, Julian Muller, who's in the audience uh, over there, and our co-executive producer, David Dreyer, up here on stage with me, how delighted we are to be here today. Um, and I think one of your speakers earlier this morning, I think it was John Chang, said the C-100 is uh, um, in the habit of doing firsts. Well, this is the first time anybody has seen a glimpse of, uh, of our film, so we're delighted to add to that. <laughs> There uh, is a stubborn historical uh, tendency um, going back all the way to the Peloponnesian War for um, war to break out uh, whenever an ascendant power like China uh, challenges a ruling power like the United States economically, geopolitically, or militarily. And there's a professor at Harvard, Professor Allison, who has documented 12 cases out of 15 since the year 1500 uh, where this has occurred. So in many respects, one can say that the default option in the U.S.-China relationship is war. And our film is about how do you prevent war. We ask the question, how do you prevent war? between China and the United States. Now, having said all that, and, and notwithstanding the comments from Professor Stigler, uh, Stiglitz um, uh, this afternoon, or at lunch, uh, there's a long history in the United States of false alarms. In 1957, when Sputnik was launched, um, Paul Samuelson, also a, a future Nobel Prize winner led a team of academics uh, forecasting that by the year 1984 the Soviet Union would overtake the United States in terms of economic uh, might and, and power. Uh, last time I checked Russia was half the size of Italy. Um, in 1979 uh, it, uh, there was another professor at Harvard, uh, Professor Vogel, who kicked off the Japan scare. But of course, that was before the lost decade. Um, and today, Japan not only has not eclipsed the United States, but it's been eclipsed by China. And, and Dominic, just um, maybe to conclude in the opening uh, comments, there if you look at the commonality between all of these um, companies, all of these countries that have uh, been forecast to eclipse the United States, it's interesting. It comes down, it's always the same three or four factors. Their students work harder than us. They're better at math and science. Uh, their cultures uh, dictate a more longer term social um, horizon rather than you know us Americans who go for instant gratification so I think you know the verdict is still very much out on on whether China will eclipse the United States uh, in in any measure uh, but it certainly is the issue of the day and that's why we made the movie thank you so congressman Dreyer uh, how did you get involved? Well, um, you know, they, they say that uh, politics is Hollywood for ugly people. <laughs> and so, obviously, Gray Davis aside, I won't comment on Jerry Brown. Now, having brought up their names, I have to state this was my segue here. I promised at lunch, if you saw when the discussion was taking place at our table with the, with the speakers at lunch, when Jerry Brown uh, announced that he got an end to this kitchen that he claimed that Gray Davis had built. 
uh, Gray Davis immediately told me that that kitchen had actually been built by Pete Wilson. <laughs> and so it's wonderful to have my, my friends and new neighbors since I've moved to West Los Angeles, Sharon and Gray Davis here. And I'm the Republican here who's actually taking the hit for my team since we had uh, uh, all the uh, Democrats talking about pointing the finger of blame on the issue of the kitchen. But to answer your question, uh, Dominic, um, Bill Mundell has been a friend of mine for 30 years, and he, uh, it's interesting, he, he referred to the fact that Paul Samuelson was uh, a Nobel laureate, and we of course heard at lunch from Joe Stiglitz, who's a Nobel laureate, but you all should know, for those of you who don't, that uh, we have the offspring of Professor Robert Mundell, who's, who in 1999 received the Nobel Prize. This is his son here. Uh, so I, I want those of you who are not aware of that. And you should know also that Professor Mundell is someone who has been very involved in China for many, many years. Uh, so the reason I got into this, frankly, is that my very good friend, Bill Mundell, started talking to me about this issue. And he talked to me about it because he knew that for me, having originally been elected to the seat in the Congress that sent Richard Milhouse Nixon in 1946 to Washington, D.C., I went in 1980, and in the late 1980s, um, I spent time with President Nixon from then up until the time he passed away in 1994, and spent a lot of time talking with him about China. He introduced me to Henry Kissinger then, and, and, uh, and I think back to the one of the saddest days in Chinese, certainly recent Chinese history, June 4th of 1989, Tiananmen Square. Uh, I joined with colleagues of mine uh, marching from the U.S. Capitol to the Chinese Embassy to demonstrate our horror and outrage over what happened in Tiananmen Square. And four weeks later, I was one of the floor managers in the Congress for the renewal of most favored nation trading status with the People's Republic of China. And I'd like to build on a point, I mean, Bill's very thoughtful remarks, the, the most recent case that, that he didn't mention of the Thucydides trap, where one country begins to transcend another economically, militarily, or geopolitically, the great exception, of course, was the Cold War. The Cold War, the conflict between the Soviet Union and the United States of America, where each country knew very well that what would happen if we were to take action, mutually assured destruction. We knew that if this conflict were to take place, it would obliterate the planet. We wouldn't have to worry about global climate change. You know, we would have all been gone. The fact is, what we're doing with this movie, and it's a great honor for me to work with Jillian and Bill and others on it, and by the way, for those of you who didn't see it up there, Malcolm Clark, who is the director, just won his second Academy Award, just won his second Academy Award for the documentary known as The, the Lady in Number Six, who was the oldest living Holocaust survivor. She died one week before the Oscars were given at the age of 110. And for those of you who hadn't, haven't seen it, I commend it to you. The reason I mention these two Oscars, the most recent one that, that our director won just a few weeks ago, he believes this movie is the most important work of his life. And so I think that when Dominic mentioned Oscar, you don't want to say anything like that. Dominic said it, I didn't. I do think that we, uh, we, we, we should know that with what we've just seen, uh, that there is potential there. You know, a, a few months ago I was uh, in Singapore with um, meeting with the uh, Prime Minister and others, and I sat with the Foreign Minister for a while, and we began talking about the issues of, um, that are in, uh, you know, on, on the radar screen. And of course, Syria is what is the major topic of discussion because of the horrible situation that exists there. It is awful, and it's a very high priority. But the Foreign Minister looked to me and he said, you know, it's important to remember that it, what is most urgent is not always what is most important. What is most urgent is not always what is most important. And I truly believe that the relationship between the People's Republic of China and the United States of America is the most important bilateral relationship on the face of the earth. And that's why it is absolutely essential that we do everything that we possibly can to strengthen and build 
on that relationship. And in the panel that sat here just before lunch, uh, the discussion centered in large part over the nationalism that exists in both countries. And the perception was the last question that we had up here on the screen before we went to lunch. And this movie, I believe, can play a big role in dealing with that challenge of the perception in both the People's Republic of China and the United States as well. In, in terms of uh, when you talk about this perception, uh, there is just so much media hype in terms of when it comes to China. I think the good example will be, you know, the recent acquisition of Smithfield. You know, uh, you, I mean, there's literally, immediately, all the, from CNN, Bloomberg, you know, to New York Times, LA Times, their day-to-day -day article about, wow, what exactly does this mean to America? I mean, are we going to be losing jobs? Are we going to be losing ability to eat more pork? You know, all kinds of different question marks. And uh, to what extent, I mean, like... Pork going to be polluted because it's <laughs> yeah. owned by a Chinese operation. There you go. Yeah. So uh, to what extent that you see that, like, for example, uh, I, I understand that you actually have interviewed uh, somebody in, 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 in that city. The mayor. Yeah, the mayor. The mayor, okay. Uh, can you share with me what the mayor's reaction to uh, uh, this acquisition? Yeah. Um, let me, let me uh, uh, back up, though, just a little bit first on U.S. perception uh, of China, because I think this is absolutely crucial. Uh, I do not believe it's possible to move the needle fundamentally on U.S.-China relations without first changing U.S. public opinion towards China. There's a long history of anti-Chinese sentiment in this country going back, as you know, before the Exclusion Act. Uh, it's memorialized in our popular culture uh, with caricatures like Fu Manchu and Charlie Chan and so forth. But its modern manifestation is related to the loss of middle class jobs, which are, are blamed for the most part on uh, China's rise. And um, if, you, if you put this all together, then you have to ask yourself the question, how do we turn around US public opinion? And I think um, present company excluded, I think we can all but give up on the political class in America for the simple reason that China has proven to be an irresistible boogeyman. Absolutely. It's, you, you look at the campaign that uh, Barbara Boxer ran the last time she ran for the United States Senate in California. It was basically one commercial about outsourcing jobs to China, and it was enormously effective. So whatever wins in politics, rules in politics. So I think it's, it's going to be very difficult to rely on the political class to turn that around. Then, then there's the media, which, which you brought up. Um, and the, the media is, you know, certainly we found out going around the country um, that it's, it's astonishingly biased uh, and, and uh, fervently anti-Chinese. Um, when we interviewed the mayor of Smithfield, Virginia, uh, which is the site of the, the big pork acquisition of the Smithfield uh, company, the uh, first thing he said before we started the interview was um, that he had already had 30 interviews. Everyone from CNN to Fox had been there and interviewed him. And we asked him, oh, was there any kind of common theme or, or common denominator of that? He said, only one. He said, that they would not end the interview until I at least said one negative thing about China. <laughs> so it's a, it's, a, it's a vexing problem and something that um, obviously one of our inspirations for making this movie was to you know, go over the heads of the media, go over the heads of the political class and try to resonate directly with the American people. And I had a little bit of experience with this, and I, Dominic, I hope you won't mind if I 
make a uh, slight diversion here. I, I produced one other documentary film uh, before this film, and it was a film called Gerrymandering. Um, and I, I produced the film out of desperation because for almost a quarter of a century in this state, uh, various proponents, including myself, I was a proponent for one of the redistricting measures, had tried to change this, um, this system, this scourge on American democracy um, through the uh, initiative process. And what we really found was that it was enormously difficult to resonate with traditional political marketing techniques like 90-second commercials um, or direct mail pieces. And so we made this film. We didn't quite know how it was going to play out. And uh, it, the night that it uh, premiered at the Tribe Tribeca Film Festival, um, then Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, who was in the movie, uh, as is Governor Davis, um, said, um, made a, they, they did a promo on the Jay Leno show about the movie. So we got a lot of visibility. The next thing I knew, Charles Munger Jr. calls me. And he was planning his own initiative to change the gerrymandering process in California. He called me and he said, could I, could I get a copy of the film? I had no idea. She said, I saw it on The Tonight Show. I'd just like to look at a copy. Well, he looked at a copy of the film. And then he called me back about a week later and he said, listen, I've got a crazy idea. Do you have a distributor yet for the film? And I said, no, no, we, ha we didn't. This is a documentary film producer's dream, by the way. <laughs> well, how about if I finance the um, theatrical release of the film? We'll do a full theatrical release, but under one condition. I want to buy a million copies of the movie and I want to, for the first time in political history, direct mail to high probability California voters a whole movie that's already out there in the theaters. And that's exactly what he did. And I don't think it's any coincidence that for the first time in almost a quarter of gerrymandering reform passed in the state of California. And that made me, that inspired me to go on and paint, as, as David said, on a bigger canvas which is to move the needle on the U.S.-China relationship with a movie. Good. I'm going to, uh, uh, next week, work out a distribution right for you with uh, <laughs> Charlie Munger Sr. <laughs> uh, I'm going to Berkshire Hathaway, you know, and have a conversation with uh, Warren and Charlie, you know. And okay, well, we'll, I will we'll, say this. If you're going to do that, <laughs> Dominic, I, I, I need to preface this. After he made me the offer, he called me back five minutes later, and he said, Bill, I want to be very clear about one thing. I am not investing in your movies. At, <laughs> at Berkshire Hathaway, we don't believe in investing in movies. He said, I'm licensing your movie, which is already complete. <laughs> and buying a million copies of it. There you go. But, but the, that shows you know, uh, the, the, you know, the powerful impact of a movie, you know, because you know, it, it, when you get a good movie out, it can touch people so much, you know, and, and, and I think that, you know, the last movie you talk about on gerrymandering, in fact, it changes, you know, California, California you know, political process, you know, dramatically. Because now, you know, we have primary that will elect maybe two Democrats or two Republicans instead of just always that, you know, it has to be one person from each party. It can really neutralize, you know, the political process. Hopefully, we'll get more moderate you know, right. individuals who will be sort of like leading the uh, uh, California, you know, political, you know, arena instead of like extreme from both sides. And know? what really happened here was a commission that sought to depoliticize the effort of drawing these lines because, again, Mr. Lampton and the, la and the panel that sat here before, t the first issue that he said was a problem was gerrymandered districts around the United States of America. And so I think that you know, politics exists in marriages. You can't completely get rid of politics. I mean, we, we know that you can't, but you can work to diminish the political control, and that's exactly what the establishment of this bipartisan commission did. And you, Dominic, talk about, uh, we've been talking about the issue of perception. One of the things that, that Sharon and Gray and, and John and, and anyone else who's been 
in politics or elective office knows very well is, is we, we regularly say that perception is reality. Perception is reality in politics. But I, uh, interestingly enough, I had kind of a sobering uh, indication that that's not always the case, and it's one of the reasons that I wore the necktie that I'm wearing today. The tie that I'm wearing was given to me by Tung Chi Hua 17 years ago, this coming July 1st. And you all remember, following the Boxer Revolution, the 99-year control that the Brits had of Hong Kong, that changed, and uh, I was there in the pouring rain with Prince Charles and everybody else for this handover. And while I'd always said perception is reality, I learned that it really isn't because on July 1st of 1997, Chinese tanks were rolling into the streets of Hong Kong. And when that happened, the perception was that we were going to see a dramatic change to the one country, two systems policy. And as we all know, that clearly has not happened. And so that experience in and of itself told me that perception is important, and in politics, because people make decisions on it, perception is reality, but in fact, as we deal with an issue like the one we're trying to tackle with this movie, the perception that exists in both the People's Republic of China and the perception that exists in the United States of America, I think that we've got a good chance for real success. I, I, well, I would, go ahead. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. I think the, um, I'm optimistic uh, looking out several years about turning around U.S. public opinion on China. And I, I'm optimistic um, primarily because I think if, if, if you look at the most direct way to change U.S. public opinion about China, it would be to give back the jobs they took. In other words, uh, reverse, you know, go full circle with globalization and bring back those jobs. And I see a scenario, you know, buried in this treasure trove of statistics on U.S.-China relations. I, I see a uh, scenario where um, uh, exactly that could, could happen. If the United States doesn't you know, move off the trajectory of greater inter economic integration with China. Let me just, let me give you two statistics. I mean, we've heard a lot of statistics today, so I'm sure you guys are completely burnt out on statistics. But let me give you two that really matter as far as job creation in the United States and that are relevant to China. One is that, you know, according to the United Nations and other sources, there's going to be 400 million new Chinese entering the middle class over the next decade. That is staggering. That is a staggering market. And, from 235 and a day. From, from 235 to, to 635. 635. And, and given, given that, and, and, and you know, I don't share Professor Stiglitz's view uh, that you know, manufacturing in this country isn't going to get a significant bump. I think it is going to. And I think those are going to create the types of jobs. We all know that export jobs tend to pay more than your average jobs. And we're looking at, if we can be a little patient and not shoot ourselves in the foot with China right now, I think we're looking substantially at a, at a substantial number of those jobs coming back, and they'll be good jobs, the type of middle-class jobs that this country desperately needs right now. And maybe that's one, let me just finish, that's, that's one statistic. I want to give one more statistic, which is this incredible mountain of monetary reserves, three and a half trillion dollars, that can be moved at the flick of a switch for good or evil, literally, it's liquid. That money is liquid. And, and that money is ours to lose. That money, properly deployed, mm -hmm. if you look at China's self-interest and you look at our self-interest, should be going back into rebuild America's infrastructure and to rebuild it without increasing debt. That's the only way to do it, to actually get that money back in in the form of equity uh, and, and rebuild debt. And I know we're going to talk about foreign direct investment later, but my point is that constitutes something almost equivalent to the Marshall Plan. With the, with the volume of money that we are talking about, 
that can make its way into U.S. infrastructure. Those are also good middle-class jobs that will be created as a result of it. If we can do that, we will change fundamentally uh, U.S. public perception of China, and the U.S.-China relationship will change as part of that process. Maybe I can just build on this a little bit to sit, look at the topic that you had for the Committee of 100 meeting here. Common ground. Common ground is what your focus is on, but I think one of the important things about common ground is that many times you can seek to find common ground from your differences. And capitalizing on those differences is important. Bill has just talked about infrastructure. Well, one of the things that we know that the People's Republic of China does extraordinarily well is infrastructure development. Bill and I have taken the one hour ride from Beijing to Tianjin, and it is an incredible train to ride. That is a great strength that exists, and I know that in this state, we would obviously very much like to have the ability to have the kind of infrastructure improvements that are there, and I believe that we can learn some lessons so even though there's a difference there, it can potentially be a common ground. And then there's a great, and by the way, I listen to all these economists, I'm not an, an economist, but I do know the economic theory of comparative advantage. And that's to, again, buttress Bill's challenge to Professor Stiglitz, and that is, in economies, countries do what they do best. That's what comparative advantage is all about. And there are so many things that are going to be done well here and there are things that are going to be done well in China. And while uh, it was mentioned at lunch that China's economy may have already transcended ours, I'm not one who's going to wring my hands over that. China has a population that may be nearly five times the size of the United States. And in light of that, to have an economy that maybe be, is a little bigger than ours is not going to lead to the ruination of the United States of America. But there's an area of strength that we have here in the United States that Bill and I have been working on and we believe can inure to the benefit of China. And it's an issue that has been discussed at every, um, at every panel that I've seen and, and throughout lunch. And that is the issue of climate change, the issue of environmental quality. Uh, we in the United States had a, uh, a commitment made by the federal government during, interestingly enough, President Bush's administration for alternative energy sources and clean, cleaning uh, green technology. And that commitment was made first by President Bush, and President Obama continued it. And uh, we saw a major uh, disaster with one of those companies. For those of you who may recall, the company called Solyndra. And when Solyndra went under, that immediately dried up the federal government's commitment to green technology. And by virtue of that, many of those in this state and around the country who had provided private equity in support of it, also saw that come to uh, an end. And so they have backed down. Well, we all know very well that the People's Republic of China has committed $735 billion, nearly three quarters of a trillion dollars over the next five years, to deal with the issue that everyone who's spoken so far has said. We all know about the air quality in Beijing. I suspect everyone in the room has been to Beijing and has had to deal with that. And also, it was pointed out, the great improvement that we've seen in California uh, over the past several years with good policies. Well, to deal with, again, a lot of this perception problem that we have, the notion of utilizing resources that the Chinese government has committed to the tune of three quarters of a trillion dollars to acquire some of these U.S. businesses that are headed to zero could in fact allow us to deal with many, many challenges. In Los Angeles, where I live, in Los Angeles, they say that 10% of the pollution that we breathe, 10% of the pollution that we breathe comes from Beijing. And so air pollution knows no borders at all. And that's why I believe that seeing the People's Republic of China capitalize on US technology that is being developed to improve the air quality in Beijing and around the world will dramatically improve the quality of life for us here in the United States as well. So what you're saying is that um, the way to do it is that using economic connections, uh, for example, let the Chinese to come to U.S. to help us build infrastructure, 
you know, invest in those infrastructure, type of uh, transportation, et cetera, the type of activities, and then we can turn around actually help the Chinese government in the uh, clean tech and, and then clean up the environment. And, and that will be something that, in the end, not only great for both countries, it's great for the whole world. Now, it'll be common ground. Yeah, right? absolutely. But now, one, one of the challenge of, of that direction is that what I've seen today is that more so in US, much less in, uh, in China, because anytime I talk about a win-win strategy or seeking common ground, respecting differences, every single leader in China would knock their head and say, great idea. But in US, there tend to be a tendency of a very aggressive uh, push to help China to democratize, to change, to be much more following the capital, uh, the capitalism in the Western world. And then also, we continue to demand of political reform, financial reform, and all kinds of different reforms that monetary reform that sort of the Western world's expectation and the Western world model. So do you think that China, well, I know that China continue to go in through you know, massive reform. Do you think that these sort of ongoing reform and eventually will get China to be just like US many years from now? It's gonna work or do you think China would ever gonna even be going further? Bill, maybe I'll get your, yeah, yeah. your thoughts first. I think we have to be very careful here. Um, I think um, the U.S.-China relationship uh, is, uh, differentiates itself from the um, other historical power conflicts, if you will, by virtue of the degree of integration that our two economies have. And this integration was part and parcel of a very direct 30-year bipartisan policy to draw China in, as you mentioned, Dominic, to make China uh, adhere to global standards and, and, frankly, to try to convince China to become more and more like the United States. But we may be reaching a tipping point right now. Um, we're, we seem to be at a stalemate over the same half a dozen issues uh, um, over and over and over again. And, and if we're not careful, and if the United States continues to push, I think one of your earlier speakers called it the policy of convergence. If we continue to push this policy of convergence, we may get backlash. We may get a Russia. We may get an Egypt. And so to me, what's important the integration ultimately is our insurance policy against war. It's our insurance policy against the Thucydides trap. If we need to find a better way to integrate that doesn't require China to become more like us. So David's talked about living with our differences and so forth, but it's a lot more than living with our differences because if you want to continue integration, it's capitalizing on our differences. So what do I mean by that? Um, let, me, let me give you an example. We may be philosophically opposed to state-directed capitalism, but that doesn't mean that we can't use state-directed capitalism to our advantage the way the Chinese used unfettered capitalism in their coastal cities uh, starting 30 years ago, to their advantage to lift 600 million people out of extreme poverty in 30 years. We need, to get, we need to get a lot better at playing this game. So one of the ideas David mentioned with respect to creating a new form of um, public, a new model of public-private partnership in the environment, the, 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 um, the same thing with respect to infrastructure. What, what are the virtues of state-directed capitalism? Well, number one, it's very patient capital. Our capital in this country isn't patient. The country is littered right now with clean tech startups that are one quarter, one third, one half finished, that, were, that had perfectly good business models, but the business models were built on the assumption 
that the U.S. government would continue to provide subsidies for his eye long as the eye could see. Then, as David mentioned, post Solyndra, post the 2008 financial crisis, that money uh, dried up. But state-directed capitalism is patient capital. It's scale. I mean, we could never devote almost a trillion dollars in five years to clean up the environment. Uh, and and it's, it's also speed. So those are three assets that we can capitalize on, but we've got we've to actually make deals. And you know, people talk about vision all the time. And this is, this is a vision, a new vision for a US-China relationship. But you know, as, as Thomas Edison said, vision without execution is hallucination. Okay, and that's where we're at. We need people like you, Dominic, to you know use your business acumen to connect people and uh, and make these types of deals happen. Deals that capitalize on our differences, deals that continue to uh, to uh, create an integrated economy between the U.S. and China, and then we'll have a very different relationship with the PRC. Great, uh, David. Uh, so. Along the same line, uh, we heard uh, a few speakers talk about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP. Right. Uh, it's come somewhat related to the, the question I just talked about. Right. Can you share a little bit yeah. of your thought? I have a, a, a different take on the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, than the one that you have heard about uh, earlier today. Uh, a year ago this week, I penned a piece for the Wall Street Journal in which I, uh, we can get copies of that for you, you can get it just at the, at the journal, um, which I did something that was uh, seen as counterintuitive by many, and that is, is I advocated China's entry into the Trans-Pacific Partnership. But I did so, obviously, conditionally. Um, and it was really, in, in many ways, aspirational. In 2000, um, President Clinton asked me to be the, the uh, lead Republican to help him Nice to see you, Sheridan Gray. Thanks for being with us. Have a nice trip back. We'll see you back in L.A. Okay, thanks for being here. Um, one of the things that, that happened, President Clinton had asked me to be the uh, Republican, or I was more assigned to, to be the Republican, to help with China's entry into the World Trade Organization, basically establishing permanent normal trade relations with the People's Republic of China. So we were able to make that happen, to encourage China to be forced to live with a rules-based trading system. And uh, along with that, as we all know, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations um, has brought China into a trading agreement, a free trade agreement. And so these two international fora have welcomed China. And Professor Stiglitz talked about you know, partnerships and free, free trade agreement. The point is, is that every one of these agreements is driving in the direction, I mean, I suppose if you want to be correct, you'd call it a freer trade agreement. Uh, it's driving in the direction of the diminution of those limitations, tariff and non-tariff barriers. And um, I thought it was very correct in the earlier panel to point to the fact that China needs to improve its relations with its neighbors. That's something that is important, and in fact, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, I, I never believed that the Trans-Pacific Partnership was seen as a poke in the eye of China, and I never believed that the pivot, and I've spent time with Kurt Campbell and others talking about this who really had launched it, I never saw it as a poke in the eye at China. I do believe that China was wrong in trying to discourage some of its neighbors to be part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's right now an 11-nation bloc. We did have a very modest breakthrough in Japan in the last 24 hours following President Obama's visit there. We know he's in Malaysia right now, headed to Manila. Uh, the fact is, um, if you look at the nations on this side of the Pacific and that side of the Pacific that are part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, I believe that if some issues can be addressed that China could become a member. Obviously, what is the most important one? SOEs, state-owned enterprises. That is the greatest barrier for China's entry into the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And I have to say that, that Bill and I have just uh, spent time with, uh, with Governor John Huntsman, who very much hoped to be here and sent his regrets. And I spent a couple of hours with him last week and, and, uh, and, and he was sorry, but we talked at length about a number of these issues. And if you look at Deng Xiaoping and his reforms, uh, Governor Huntsman believes, and I happen to concur, that Xi Jinping has the potential to clearly 
be as transformational. And I think that the issue of tackling state-owned enterprises is going to be critical that if that issue is taken on, uh, my, what I advocate is, is they work towards winding down the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. What I hope is that it will be able to remain open so that as there are reforms made to state-owned enterprises, as some of these other issues are addressed, that China can become part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And before TTIP, which is the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, it will be, even without China, it will be the single largest free trading bloc in the history of the world. Thank you. So uh, we run out of time, so I'm just going to ask you one last quick question. Yeah. What exactly the heck are you doing in Sunnyland? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting. Thank you, Dominic. And, and I, I will tell you that as I was getting ready to leave the Congress, I had been asked years ago, and I know that there's no Chinese translation for the word Sunnylands. It's the Annenberg Estate. Uh, but um, my, my parents had been friends of Ambassador and Mrs. Walter Annenberg. They were lifelong friends. I eulogized them when they passed away, and they had asked me for years to be involved with Sunnylands. It's an amazing place. You all are familiar with it. Ambassador Walter Annenberg, who had been Richard Nixon's ambassador to the Court of St. James, built this home with his nine-hole golf course around it in Rancho Mirage, next to Palm Springs. And um, three decades ago, I was sitting with Ambassador Annenberg, and he said to me, uh, having come back from across the Atlantic, and we all know how important the transatlantic relationship is, especially with Ukraine, in the forefront today and the problems with Russia. It's very important. But Ambassador Annenberg said the future is around the Pacific. The future is around the Pacific, and he said this to me decades ago, and to me it was very prescient. Today, as you all know, two-thirds of the global GDP and two-thirds of the global population is around the Pacific. I mean, how important is that? That's the future. And that's why having Governor Brown, Governor Davis, and John Chang and other California officials, and I was pleased for three and a half decades, nearly three and a half decades to be part of that, carrying the California message in Washington. We are in this state uh, clearly the wave of the future. So I decided when I was leaving Congress that one of the many things that I'm involved in, along with filmmaking with Jillian and, and Bill and, and a bunch of other ventures that Bill has gotten me involved in and hanging out with the likes of my con former constituent Dominic and Ellen and, and all, I... Uh, wanted to spend a little time with Sunnylands. And so just as I was leaving, I was at the White House Christmas party with President Obama. And President Obama said, well, David, so what are you going to be doing now that you're leaving Congress after all these years? And I'd worked, worked actually closely with him on a number of issues. And I said, well, one of the things, Mr. President, that I'm going to be doing is, is I'm going to be associating myself with this amazing Annenberg estate with the Annenberg Foundation and his home at Sunnylands. And one of my priorities is to see you visit and so, lo and behold, thanks to the great team at the Annenberg Retreat at Sunnylands, who worked very hard talking to people in the White House, uh, within a very short period of time, as you all know, we had the first actual retreat. Now, you can go back to the Shanghai Communique. There had been many meetings that had taken place between the presidents of the United States and the president of China. But never before had there actually been a retreat, which is what Sunnylands is all about. And so that took place, uh, as we all know, uh, at Sunnylands. It was just a beginning, and uh, it's a very special place. By the way, um, it's become very popular, especially among tourists from China who very much well, love the idea of visiting Sunnylands. And I should say to those of you who haven't been there, we have a structure. Don't call me. You can call them. Uh, but, uh, but there is, a, there is a, a, a structure for people to tour and visit and see the place, and so I would encourage all of you to do that, and, um, and just let me, let, me, let me just close by saying this, because I know that you've run out of time, and that is um, Dominic Ng is an inspiration to so many of us, and Clarence has really big shoes to fill, I've got to, got to, got to tell you, and uh, one little funny story that I just learned as we were coming up here is, is that Dominic thought he had a two-year term and didn't know he had a three-year term as the chairman. And so I know that uh, Ellen and Dominic are very enthused about passing the torch on to, uh, to Clarence. I know that from our conversations. But the Committee of 100, and I know I speak for Bill and for Jillian and our other friends who are here, uh, is a very, very important organization. And I'm very pleased and honored to be associated with it and, of course, with my good friend Dominic Ng. Well, thank you both for being here. And uh, that concludes our uh, panel discussion. And we're looking forward to... Uh, See you at the Oscar. At the Oscars. Okay. Okay.
Thank you so much. Good job.